Dolce & Gormas um, by Wilfred Owen is one of the most famous war poems ever written, certainly in the English language. It is the poem that makes him famous and has made him, again, probably the, one of the most well-known uh, writers of protest, war protest poetry. So the style of the poem is just in seven quatrains, right? So A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, the rhyme scheme. So in the first stanza, sax rhymes with bax, and through rhymes with trudge, not very well. No, sludge rhymes with, there we go, sludge rhymes with trudge, etc. <clears throat> and as we've talked about before, that type rhyme scheme helps to keep everything kind of unified. And that's important in a poem where we have these different um, situations or ideas. As Poetry for Students explains, each stanza kind of, he divides the stanzas based on what it's doing. So the first stanza is describing the marching soldiers. The second one describes the gas attack. And the third, the effect on the speaker. And the fourth, um, it's that you, if you felt this, if you had seen this, you kind of thing, addressing the reader directly. The dominant meter here is iambic, which again is supposed to represent or um, English speech, right, most commonly. And so um, he has re written this common language, easily memorable, tight, unified idea about describing this moment of um, in a war, the specific moment in a, a war. And we'll talk more about what war and that kind of thing. <clears throat> so some of the poetic elements that you see here um, that we've talked about, I think all of these, hopefully we've talked about all of these to some degree. Um, but I don't know that I've actually, maybe, anyway. Irony, which the actual intent is expressed in words which carry the opposite meaning. So the title is, in, in Latin, it means it's sweet and fitting to die for one's country. But from the very beginning, the very first line, it's really clear, as he says, bent double, like old beggars under sacks, knock knee, coughing like hags, we curse through the sludge, through sludge, sorry, not the, through sludge. So that is completely the opposite. There's nothing sweet or uh, romantic or... Um, anything worth praising in this image that he is describing for us. So um, we have irony throughout, the irony from the title, right? And from that last line that in fact, it's the opposite. So what Owen is trying to do is to say the opposite. He's trying to initiate a new kind of war poetry um, than what had been written before. And he's trying to suggest that what people have written, the Victorians who came before this, <clears throat> the people who lived under the rule of Queen Victoria, they tended to celebrate war. Remember, under Victoria, the British Empire had expanded over the whole world, so it's not super surprising that they would think that war was this great thing to do, to go into battle. They were the dominant force, but here this was not the case. This is a battle in Europe, and um, World War One was pretty brutal. And so um, the title is an ironic title, and it carries us, the entire poem shows the opposite of what um, the title says, and the rest of the poem is what he's really trying to say. He has a lot of comparisons, similes. Remember, similes are just comparisons, but they use the word like instead of not. Um, a metaphor would be a comparison, but you don't use the word like. So we have lots of them, right? Like old beggars, like hags, like a man in fire. On fire or line? Okay, hold on. In fire or line? Yeah, in fire or line. Um, I, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning, like the devil sick of sin. Like He's making all these comparisons, right? Soldiers are old, suddenly become old and decrepit. Um, hags are another way of describing witches, so it's otherworldly. He's making all these, he's trying to have people sitting at home in England who again have been taught their whole lives that war is glorious. 
he wants them to understand that it is not. And so he's trying to make comparisons that he thinks people will understand. So especially when he's describing this gas attack, right? They pioneered this use of gases in the in World War I. So technology really made World War I one of the bloodiest. And so with weapons, but this is one of the weapons, right? This gas attack. And so as under a green sea, I saw him drowning, comparing being in a gas attack to draw, drowning. So people at home could probably understand what it's drowning. They were England is surrounded by water, but they had never experienced a gas attack before. So here he is describing it to give the full horrible impact of what it's like to watch someone else die in this particular way. Um, he uses exaggeration a little bit here, but I think like in line six where he says, um, many had lost their boots but limped on, bloodshot, all went lame, all blind. It's unlikely, but all of them did. Um, they continued to move, but this exaggeration doesn't feel like an exaggeration when compared to what the speaker is seeing, the tragedy and the horror of everything that he is seeing here. These are some of the poetic elements he uses to get his theme across, his, the idea. Um, so if the topic is war, the question always for theme is what is he saying about war? And I think it's pretty clear that it's that no one should ever romanticize war. Right? No one should ever um, write about it as if it was this great, wonderful, valiant, heroic thing to do. Right, um, And in rejecting this idea of war being romantic, Owen essentially becomes, becomes one of the most powerful anti-war poets of the 20th century, as we have here written. So... Um, and this photo that I have here for you is my attempt to um, just give you one uh, quick photograph of uh, a trench because this was the big innovation in World War I also. They did not use these trenches very much before and very much after. But in World War I, this is actually German soldiers, which is who the British were fighting. They would dig these big holes and then shoot at each other, right? You can see that man standing in the guard. And so they would just stay for weeks and months, just each dug into a part of a bit of land inside um, these bunkers, these trenches, they called them. And um, it was a really hellish way to live. And yeah, outside in the elements, right? They're not inside, they're not staying warm, but they are just they're sleeping there, they're eating there. It's this really um, elaborate system to try to protect themselves by digging into the earth, but it didn't allow for a lot of forward mobility. And so people were just stuck for really long, long periods of time. So this is one of the things that Owens is trying to get people to understand. So here's a picture of him when he enlisted. He was 22 and he enlisted. He was a poet. He wanted to write poetry. And when the war came, he enlisted. Um, he joined what's called the Artist Rifles Brigade. Um, and it's very quickly in, and he writes a, a letters about this home, that he experienced some bombing, some shooting from the mortars, and he suffered from that, from shell shock. So he sent back to England and spent about nine to 11 months, I can't remember, um, kind of recuperating, meaning helping out in other ways. Like at first he did like office things and then he trained other soldiers, but eventually he goes back into battle and um, we find in his uh, battle, uh, he, let's see, I'm sorry, um, the other officers in his brigade die, and so he must become the leader. And one week before the end of World War I, when it stopped, he was killed in battle, leading his men. Um, during his lifetime, he only published four poems, and um, this that becomes important because 
looking at the form they're in, it's hard to know what he intended because he did so many revisions of the ones he did publish, you know, what he what might have intended. Um, and so this poem in particular was not published in his lifetime. It was published long after and again became his most famous poem and probably the most famous poem, uh, anti-war poet. Um, you can see that he felt it to be, this is a quote from a critic who wrote back in 1964, that he felt it was his duty to disclose the truth of war. And in his own introduction, um, he says, above all, I am not concerned with poetry. My subject is war and the pity of war. The poetry is in the pity. I thought that was very well put, that he himself was not, he's, as he's trying to describe what he's seeing, it is so moving that that's what the poetry comes out of, is the moving of these images. And we've talked a lot about how imagery is such a key part of poetry, that writers use images in the hope of evoking an emotion, which is a lot of what the purpose of poetry is. And his emotion that I think he wants us to get here, I certainly get as I'm reading this, is horror, right? The terror of this. And it leads me to agree with him. I find him quite persuasive that it is a stupid thing to try to romanticize when we send young men, now young women too, just to kill each other um, in war. That seems like a bad idea. And that was, in fact, what he was trying to argue in this poem.